into Father Spitzer's universe once again at the very busy intersection of faith and reason where they meet. I'm Doug Keck at the Guardhouse. Happy to let you in this week, coming to you from the mothership in Irondale, Alabama, where Mother Angelica began it all. And believe it or not, it's Mother's 100th anniversary of her birth this year. So we'll be celebrating that, so look forward to that. And send us your questions at spitzersuniversityw10.com. Check out all of Father Spitzer's websites, the Magist Center one, Credible Catholic, Purposeful Universe as well. Many of your answers, if you can't get them on the show, you can find on one of those websites. And of course, this program is always available on our EWTN YouTube channel and on our EWTN On Demand page. Just go to the website, it's easy to find. And while on our On Demand page, be sure to check out Eucharistic Journey for a New Evangelization with the late sister Joan Noreen, who did programs for many years on EWTN. And during this celebration of the National Eucharistic Revival that EWTN is playing a big part in, uh, you can join Sister Joan as she reflects on the significance of the Eucharist, which Mother was always talking about, and how it plays a major role in evangelization. Amen. Check it out for free, on demand, and one of many programs available to you. Constantly adding programming there. Check it out on demand to fit your schedule. This week we close out Pride from Father's book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives, which is still available and will continue to be available through our EW10 religious catalog, of course. And the book of the month from EW10, both a servant and free, a primer in moral theology by our fond friend, father, Brian Malady. And I always want to mention that he is a host on Thursdays of EW10 Open Line, and he shows up on various programs on EW10 as well, and his books are wonderful. And with that, speaking of wonderful books, uh, we have our own father, Robert Spitzer, if you'll lead us in prayer, great to see you, Father, and kick things off. Great to be with you, too, Doug. In the name of the Father, <clears throat> and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to serve in it. Please send your Holy Spirit down upon Doug, myself, our whole audience this day, so that everything we say and do and hear will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And, and obviously, uh, as a, a priest, very interested in education, uh, obviously the sciences, and a former president of Gonzaga University, and its wonderful basketball team, which mm -hmm. you were... Uh, uh, played a played a uh, not insignificant role in uh, building up that team, and I think oh, yeah. hiring the coach there, as I vaguely recall, I think if that's yes. correct, right? Yes, that's so, right. That's right. So, uh, so good work for you. Right. Which, uh, so, so speaking of Catholic universities and colleges, here's a story that came yeah. out. Uh, St. Mary's College says biological sex messaging does not align with its mission. Um, okay, this is a Daily Signal story. Uh, St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana, denying the foundation of a Turning Point USA chapter, according to an email from the Dean of Students, because Turning Point USA's messaging on biological sex does not align with the college's Catholic mission. In one email received by the Daily Signal, Liz Bauman, Director of Student Involvement and Advocacy, claimed that because St. Mary's is a Catholic institution of higher learning, the school has an obligation to be diverse, inclusive, and equitable and insists that it approves student-led clubs be the same, and they have some concerns. Obviously, uh, this is a fairly conservative organization. What I thought was interesting in, in her use of the terminology we hear all the time, diversity, inclusive, and equitable, usually uh, the E's in the middle, because they don't want to spell out DIE uh, as an acronym when they put yeah. these things together. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, well, which is more indicative of what it does to most institutions, but uh, it kills them. Yeah. But uh, yeah. with that being said, yeah. you know, again, the church wants to be sympathetic and wants to be open, but we need to be open to the truth, too, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, uh, not only the truth uh, in itself, which, of course, we want to be honest to, but also we need to look at the truth of what the consequences are going to be for individuals and to make that known. Uh, to simply just say that the issue is about, um, you know, transgenderism or whatever, being open 
to transgender people, uh, that's one thing, but uh, there are many consequences of doing this. There are many consequences of gender affirming therapy. There are many consequences of a sex change, a sexual reassignment surgery. There are many consequences that are really terrible. And I've elucidated them in previous programs. Uh, but as I said, the, the depression rates and the suicide uh, rates are just so skyrocketingly high after 10 years. Mm. I mean, there's no you know, way in which you can judge this uh, as something that's going to be beneficial to humanity, right. beneficial to the life of the person undergoing uh, such a transition. And, and similarly, um, you know, instead of actually helping people to get therapy to move toward the, the biological sex that they're never going to get rid of despite changes in appearance, uh, at the end of the day, uh, they have decided to, uh, you know, promote transitioning, which is terribly um, uh, undermining of emotional health and spiritual health. Right. Not to mention, uh, too, you know, the uh, um, the physical health of the person. As I uh, said in previous programs, the morbidity rates go up by a factor of three times in women, two times in men. Uh, once um, one starts undergoing. Uh, gender-affirming therapy, that is to say, right. uh, receiving sex hormones uh, to get rid of the uh, former uh, biological traits you were born with and to bring in uh, right. other ones uh, that um, were, you were not born with. Right. Very good. Okay. Here's another story somewhat related. I hope we're not uh, just harping on this, but I thought this was interesting because this is not some study from Pew or somebody else or where somebody... This is a CDC mm -hmm. report published in February, so just last month, assessed uh -huh. significantly increased rates of feelings of hopelessness, sadness, and suicidality yeah. among LGBTQ yeah. plus high school students relative to their heterosexual counterparts. Goes on to say, percentage of heterosexual students stating they had seriously attempted suicide during the previous year, or considered it, should say, was 15% with 45% of the LGBTQ plus students reporting the same. You've said that many times, almost that, that tripling number there. More, ac more acutely, 12% yeah. of heterosexual high schoolers said that they had made a suicide plan during the past years, with 37% of the LGBTQ plus counterparts saying the same. 6% of heterosexual students claim yeah. to have attempted suicide during the previous 12 months against 22 percent, okay, almost four times as many yeah. for the LGBTQ yeah. plus mm -hmm. student. And that's not Father Spitzer, mm -hmm. that's not EW10, that's the CDC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, as I have been practically shouting from the yardarm, there can't be anything more emotionally unhealthy than, you know, you know many of these students, you know, are already, re you know, uh, you know, uh, receiving gender-affirming therapy. They're already uh, receiving hormones, et cetera, and many of them who are desirous of, uh, of uh, receiving those things um, and not getting them without any consequent therapy to deal with their anxieties, their true anxieties, that's what's causing this huge surge in suicide rates. And by the way, mm -hmm. just in the regular population, you know, straight across the board, the suicide rates among young uh, teenagers is just skyrocketing. And uh, I mean, it's, it's all over the place. Even the New York Times is acknowledging that something is amiss. In mm -hmm. fact, there was a, a recent New York Post uh, article that, um, that came out. It was from the, uh, a person who had lost God and kind of abandoned herself uh, to, I think, Cosmopolitan magazine. And she, um, uh, she was working there for quite some time. And uh, she talked about what happened to her emotionally uh, and spiritually and um, how um, she just saw <clears throat> from the inside out, you know, that at the end of right. the day, uh, what was causing it was she had no sense of peace, no sense of security, right. no sense of, uh, you know, being fastened to a particular identity, uh, no sense of future, no sense of hope, no sense of uh, ultimate fulfillment, no sense of ultimate meaning. She, she basically says at the end of the day, you know, I, 
I, I desperately needed God. Right. And then when she kind of refound God, she uh, she um, basically tells that, yeah, this is this is what's needed right. to keep our young people out of, uh, you know, this. <laughs> it's, it's a surge. Right. I mean, we're talking about, you know, not just the COVID surge, although that is significant. But there is, you know, the, a, a surge in itself that preceded COVID and now is succeeding COVID that is also pushing these suicide rates over the top. It's all about ego comparative identity. You know, I, I've said how many times that this level two is so destructive mm -hmm. of a young person's life. And it's all about, you know, autonomous free will when it never, you know, gives the rewards it promises. Mm -hmm. And of course, the loss of God that comes with, you know, seeking this pure autonomy of, of will. Um, you know, you're gonna, you know, God's gonna, can't be on top if, if you're the top, <clears throat> if your will is supreme, if you've basically defaulted to Nietzsche, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, the will to power, God's got to go, as Nietzsche says. And of course, if he goes emotionally from you, that's where you see these doubles, doubling and tripling of suicides. And of course, um, you know, all of these things, you combine them all together and the loss of morality, just traditional morality that comes with, um, you know, the loss of God. I mean, the two things go together. God and, and morality go together, and right. you lose uh, uh, one, you're gonna lose isn't the that, other. Isn't that, part of the all isn't that mm -hmm. part of the problem, though, is that people have convinced themselves that somehow there's this moral compass that's already there that this, uh, everybody sort of agrees to, and we don't really need God in the middle of that. We can put him, uh, to the side and everything will still be fine. They don't understand that if there is no God, then all is possible. Everything is okay. Yeah, well, this Parvatiya study that, that was done uh, actually show, it was a very fine study. But what it actually shows though is it's not just that morality gives a series of, um, you know, uh, moral statements or moral norms that are to be followed. Mm -hmm. Uh, religion is very important in moving one to actually accede to those moral uh, norms. So in other words, uh, you know, if, if a person is religiously inclined, the odds of them acting according to a specific morality in a specific situation is much, much higher. I forget the exact percentages now. Is much, much higher than um, if one did not have religion, but believed and heard of the same moral norms uh, that should be followed. So religion does give that impetus. And I would also hasten to add, it gives the grace because sometimes we just can't do it of ourselves. But having that grace there that comes from prayer, that grace that comes from the sacraments, uh, that grace you know, from God that helps us toward moral conversion and toward a persistent move toward a moral conversion, it's not just in the action, it's in the overall direction of our lives that religion has that influence. And so it's a marriage made in heaven, really, mm -hmm. uh, religion and morality, they, they really do go uh, hand in hand, right. uh, each helps the other, uh, what we would call reciprocal causation. So people who have a high degree of religious commitment are normally going to have mm -hmm. a much higher degree and success rate of being moral. And those who have high moral standards will in turn, um, uh, and, and uh, moral practice will right. in turn have a higher degree of um, religious commitment. And so it just kind of uh, right. plays on each other. and. Uh, oh, you know, expanding is there, spiral. Is there a factor as well over the fact that as a religious person or a Catholic, one has the sense of the eternal, there's something beyond what is going on here, as opposed to someone who yeah. disassociates from that, is in a, living in this material world, and as uh, Bishop Rake, who, uh, who's our bishop here, recently gave a uh, retreat for the employees, and he mm -hmm. was quoting an old song by Peggy Lee called, Is That All There Is? You know, and it's that old yeah. idea of going to the circus, doing this, falling in love, and at the end of it being, well, is that all there is to the circus? Uh, if that's all there is, yeah. then let's, you know, have a party and forget about it because life has no meaning. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, that's of course, you know, right? They shoot horses, don't they? Remember mm -hmm. that old seventies movie, right? Sure. So forth and so on. I mean, uh, complete hopelessness and despair, and that certainly was, uh, you know, a, a, a real motivator in the in the mid nineteen sixties. You know, this kind of existential despair uh, started coming into play in our culture in a new major way, and it was very, very consistent. Um, with um, the loss of religion, very consistent with the rise in the desire for autonomous freedom, right? The, the supremacy of our freedom and our will, and very uh, much, um, uh, again, cor correlative with the loss of morality. So you look at, you know, these things, and they tend to, uh, you know, hopelessness mm -hmm. increases dramatically when religion and morality go down. And, you know, loss of the sense of dignity, fulfillment, a loss of the sense of peace and security that there's something more, another force that's in control, a sense of ultimate meaning and identity. You, you start losing all those things if you start losing religion right. and morality. And, and if you, that's the whole point of my book, Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, right. is to show all of these correlations um, with uh, respect to a moral teaching right. that, right, when you abandon each one of those moral teachings, especially these 12 teachings that I talk about, when you abandon them, uh, what you see is, right, so you say, oh, pornography, oh, that's just a victimless sin. Mm -hmm. Is it? Uh, I don't think it is because you're the primary victim, right? The reader of the pornography is the primary victim. The more you read it, the more depressed mm -hmm. you become. The more you look at it, the more um, emotional in intimacy disappears from your marriage. The more you look at it, the doubling of the divorce rate is going to happen. The more you look at it, the more you engage in risky sexual behaviors. The more you look at it, the more your prayer life goes down the drain. It, actually, the more you look at it, your prayer life, your, your, your attendance of religious service keeps going down direct proportion to how, what you're doing with respect to the pornography until it pretty much gets down to zero. That's a big universe. The Oklahoma study. But I mean, the point is, it's just a disaster area. And it's not just that, it's affecting other people. It affects your family, it affects your children. These correlations are known. The risky sexual behaviors, the much more radical, um, you know, um, aggressivity toward right. the opposite sex, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are proven consequences. So I just take about 32 of these major studies and I just say, look at the evidence. I'm not just hand picking, you know, some studies. This is in every study. Right. I mean, it, you know, there's, there should be no question that this, this stuff is just utterly destructive. Right. And yet you hear the same thing from the culture. It's just a look at your screen, it's just a victimless sin. Right. You're victimless, all by yourself, right. Right. but you're killing yourself and everybody Absolutely. around you. Right, I can say anecdotally, having worked on uh, the Playboy Channel years and years ago, I saw the impact it had on people just yeah. working on it. So clearly what you're saying oh, is yeah. borne out just from my own observations. Here's another story. Uh, yeah. United Nations is uh, set to release a report at its annual Human Rights Council meeting in June to discuss the quote-unquote mm -hmm. perceived contradictions, quote-unquote, between religious freedom and sexual orientation and gender identity. They talk about religious practices and about the extent to which religious individuals have the right to a conscientious objection. Uh, their concern is that, uh, you know, that's impacting the sexual freedom. They talk about discrimination against mm -hmm. individuals based on sexual orientation or gender identity, real or presumed, repress sexual and gender diversity, and promote cisgendered, uh, whatever that is, and heteronormative norms of sexual orientation and gender identity. Yes, I actually know what it means, but it's the most ludicrous term yeah. that people now use all yeah. the time as if somehow it's appropriate to be used. But th that's where we also get government agencies and other groups who are then passing these rules that on the surface sound very good, but have a very dark side to them. Well, that's, that's the whole point, is it's half the truth. I mean, you, you go for, a, a, you know, one set of uh, what you think are normative truths, you know, if we want to be accepting of every kind of lifestyle. But the, the other side of the coin that you have to look at 
is the consequences if you do this. You know, if you do this, you can expect not only a rise in suicides of individuals, but of a suicidal hopelessness mentality within your culture. So if you're going to, you know, start doing this stuff, Look at the studies and see what happens. It's not just the fact that you're going to get, you know, also a, a rise in, in, you know, a, aggressivity or morbidity rates mm -hmm. or, or, you know, um, uh, suicide rates or something of that nature. It's not just going to be in the individuals who are actually believing the propaganda. There's a tendency or a trend that begins to form within the culture itself to reinforce the the rightness of the activity and when that happens it's it, you know you're going to see in the midst of this cultural conflict that begins to occur not just because somebody says oh i believe in transgender i don't believe in transgender now, that's not where the conflict is ultimately going to come in mm -hmm. the co conflict comes in with the conflict within ourselves the conflict you know where we see uh, on the one hand uh, you know, we feel like, okay, I've gotten what I want, my absolute freedom, everybody, you know, respects me for who I am, yet at the same time, I feel as alienated from myself as I could ever feel. I feel as empty within myself as I could ever feel. I feel the dread and the malaise of not having any absolute uh, meaning in my life or any hope or any sense of my transcendence or even my sense of self-transcendence. I have none of these things. And at the same time, <clears throat> little wonder Right. We, we know these correlations are there, you know, even self-hatred that leads to the hatred of others and the jealousy and resentment of others that arises out of the self-hatred. This is going to produce conflict. I mean, we're just, you know, like, uh, you know, hot to the touch, uh, you know, for, for cultural conflict mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it comes ultimately from self-alienation. And, uh, you know, I just rest my case on existential philosophers. I don't have to use religious philosophers to prove this. No wonder the depression rates are going up. Right. No wonder the anxiety rates are going up. No wonder the substance abuse rates are going up. No wonder the suicide rates are going up. I mean, this is to be expected. If we really were interested in the consequences of what we were promoting and took them seriously, we would run for cover. Right. I mean, this is like we're we're going crazy here by blinding ourselves with a gigantic cultural scotoma, right? A self-blinding. You know, uh, we're putting this this huge reticular activating system in front of our conscious minds, where you know we're not going to let in any data that contradicts our opinion, even if it's just sh earth-shatteringly horrible for individuals within the culture, within our families, and the culture itself we're just not gonna let it in because it could actually programmatically cause us to change and right. we're not gonna do that so uh, we've got uh, right. we've got our marching orders and the marching orders are coming from right. you know the so-called elite within the culture but alas alas truth always comes back to roost right and we can't hide right. from the facts right. and reality right itself. And, and that's why they try and explain right. it away and that's why I remember uh, I use this quote a lot recently at least which is the idea it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled uh, and that's part of the problem yeah. you have a lot of people are just unwilling to admit that maybe I was hoodwinked here's one last story before yeah. we get to the yeah. uh, questions that it's uh, Interesting story. Uh, George Weigel uh, wrote this article for the Catholic World Reporter, at least uh -huh. it was published in that. And it's, uh, it kind of focuses on Pope Francis's image of the church as a field hospital, which we've, he's used many times, mm -hmm. tending the wounded on today's yeah. social uh -huh. and cultural battlefields, which clearly resonates with Catholics across the globe. And nobody can disagree with that, that kind of approach. No. But, but he goes on to say, he said, his concern is that sometimes the Catholic doctors are AWOL working at this particular hospital. He said, cautions have been raised about the field hospital image because misused, and again, we're saying misused, it can suggest that the church merely binds wounds rather than offering a cure for what caused these wounds in the first place. And the, those cautions were not misplaced. He goes on to say, well, we adapt the image from a friend. The Catholic Church, or adapt an image from a friend, he's quoting here, the Catholic Church today is a field hospital, and some of the triage doctors, rather than curing the wounded, are insisting that the hospital no longer tell people that landmines will kill you. 
So, I mean, that's yeah. the question some people have. Well, with, that's, that's again, exactly we're getting what I was just saying. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, I have no objection to calling, uh, um, you know, the Church of Hill Hospital and Jesus Christ's uh, therapies great medicine. I, I have no objection to it. But I also have to say in the same breath, mm -hmm. we, we got to tell the whole truth. And that's what people don't want. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And, of course, the whole truth is the big problem today. Man, the manipulations that go on by s real editing of stuff in the, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. we will not uh, tell a truth that does not, uh, we'll cut it out even when it's glaring right through the screen at us. Mm -hmm. We are going to cut it out, we're going to hide it from people, and we're going to try and develop every scotoma, every self-blinding we right. can so that people will screen out all of this evidence through all the euphemisms we just pour on the culture. It's new speak to the max. It makes George Orwell look <laughs> prophetic indeed. But the point, you know, is that at the end of the day, truth will have its way. Mm -hmm. And if, if it manifests itself by the destructiveness that happens to our culture, by a cultural implosion, look at the suicide rates of young people. Right. I rest my case. A healthy culture can't be doing this. Mm -hmm. You can't get, you know, like these 50 percent, you know, increases <laughs> you know, and, and, and just terrible things over the course of just a decade, you know, what, what's going to happen to us? I mean, right. th these things are, you know, just terrible, terrible consequences. Well, you know, we're right. looking at these things. We're staring at them. We're looking at 47 percent. Well, well, there's a, young people having some sort of right. severe psychological difficulty. Well, like you said, it, it, or nearly right. at fifty percent. It's, it's kind of like the emperor's new clothes, you know, kind of being lived out yeah. writ large in our, in our society. And I'm, and there was a uh, kind of an <clears throat> image that's been used by different people at times. It's it's a shot of a reporter from a couple of years ago, reporting how a particular uh, a demonstration slash riot was mostly. Uh, you know, mostly peaceful, while the building behind him was raging on fire. And it was, you know, again, that kind yeah. of juxtaposition, the contrast between what is yeah. being said and the reality that you can see yeah. with your own eyes. So let's move on to some uh, yeah. questions from our, no, from our viewers. Mm. Dear Father Spitzer, I heard yeah. someone in the state of mortal sin without immediate access to confession could make a perfect act of contrition with intent of going to confession. I also heard that one can never be sure that they made a perfect act of contrition. What makes an act of contrition perfect? How can I ensure that my contrition is as perfect as possible, especially if I am unable to go to confession, Joseph? Well, Joseph, the first thing is, you know, that we try to do um, it out of love for Christ rather than just out of fear. Fear uh, would be an imperfect contrition, obviously. In other words, I'm scared of going to hell. Um, uh, but uh, we also want to do this for the love of Christ out of thanksgiving uh, to the Lord for creating and redeeming us uh, is one part of it. The second important part of it is what's called the firm purpose, the sincerity of the contrition. So I, I, I am sincerely sorry. I didn't want to offend God. God has given me everything in my whole life, right? And, and you know, so perfect, you know, in that sense means that that I truly am sorry for having offended the person who's given me everything, given me life, given me my immortal soul, given me the redemption that leads to my salvation. I didn't want to offend him. I did, you know, do this. And, and so that idea of, you know, um, uh, sincerity of the contrition. And finally, the firm purpose of amendment mm -hmm. that I really do intend that I'm not going to try and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, that I don't want to do this anymore. It doesn't mean I will be successful, but my intention is that I will do everything that I can not to right. get into the near occasion of sin that will lead me to this sin. Yeah. So, you know, to nip it in the bud in right. the future, I'm going to nip it in the bud. So the point... Um, you know, is, right. is I mean, well, really, you if, know, if you looked at the act of contrition, it's all in there, right? I mean, it's all in there. It's all in, in there. That's right. 
That's that's right, and I would say, but most of all, because they offend Fendi, me, my God, right. Absolutely. who are truly all good and truly deserving of all my love. When you put that out there, it's pretty clear right. <clears throat> that you're you're trying to make right. that a perfect contrition. Absolutely. So, we're going to take mean, a break on that, Father. Yeah, and, imperfect. Yeah. That's an imperfect break okay. here. So we'll be back, and <laughs> I, I'll show you full contrition when we come back from the break. But you stay with us right here in Father Spitzer's Universe. Much more ahead. Welcome back to Father Spitzer's Universe as we finish things up on this program dealing with pride from Father's book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives. And next up, we're going to pull some topics out of his book, Escape from Evil's Darkness, okay? Which, if you don't have that copy already, you can get one from our religious catalog so you can follow along with a couple of chapters we're going to pull out of that, okay? Before we get on to his latest book, which is about morality. With that said, we're going to talk, turn to Father and talk to a topic he's kind of been talking a little bit about. Dear Father Spitzer, what is anxiety from the Catholic perspective? What is its purpose? How do I deal with it? I have experienced anxiety all my life. I'm now in my 60s. It has always interfered with my life and prevented me from doing a lot of things. I feel close to God, but I just don't understand why anxiety is so controlling. This is Daniel. And a lot of people feel like, well, gee, if I have all this faith in God, and I trust in God, then what am I being anxious about? Well, Daniel, I, I think there's unhealthy anxiety, and sometimes there is some anxiety that really uh, helps us, you know, uh, prevents us from moving into, you know, uh, areas of life where there, there could really be damage or danger, uh, not just to our salvation, but to our uh, earthly existence and to our relationships. But uh, the unhealthy anxiety is, is the one where really you are uh, right with God. You, you're following, uh, you know, the, the norms of, of, of Christianity. You're, you're being decent to the people around you and to your family. You're being ethical in your workplace and your other relationships in society. And you're feeling, you know, tremendous anxiety or, or unpeace. Now, there can be a, a whole lot of reasons for that anxiety. Um, you know, some of them have a physical cause. Mm -hmm. And so you, you probably need to go and get a diagnosis to see if there is a physical cause of the anxiety. Could it be from uh, some kind of, uh, if, if it started when you were just undergoing your adolescent changes, there could be some hormonal derivative. Uh, sometimes the anxiety comes from something that you had as a child. Maybe uh, you underwent a, a severe trauma for one reason or another, or there might have been uh, some kind of abuse or, mm -hmm. or something in your life or, uh, you know, some kind of a... Um, you know, a, a terrible incident, you know, where you came close to death. And sometimes we internalize that and we begin to feel anxiety throughout the rest of our lives, you know, right? The kind of anxiety that comes from I can't be secure ever mm -hmm. because something's going to happen to me. I'm going to get, I'm going to go around the corners. <clears throat> I'm going to get punched, you know, or whatever the case may be. So the, the point is, 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 you know, some of those anxieties are clearly not healthy. And the, the way to get around those anxiety is to try and really get some treatment, um, especially if you can sort of uh, go back in your life and you can sort of see what could have undermined my security in myself. What could have undermined my security in my salvation, even when I'm mm -hmm. doing the right things and, and, and so forth? What could have undermined my security in relationships or my belief in my lovability with others? What could have undermined, and, you, know, you know, anxiety, right? There's a lack of security. There's some lack of, mm -hmm. you know, or belief, you know, that, um, you know, some sort of normal state of affairs uh, will not happen with respect to me, but I'm not declaring it. 
uh, half the time these things happen when I, when you're a kid. Um, right. And you, you just you don't even notice it. But, you know, maybe, you know, some kind of a traumatic incident. Or, like I said, sometimes it's just got a biological cause. Right, right, right. You know, there's, you know, a, a lowering of certain kinds of hormones or, or uh, levels of, of various kinds of, of enzymes and, and so forth and so on. And these things need to be tested for uh, to make sure that you don't have artificially low whatever it might be uh, in the brain or in the spinal column, et cetera. And so that, that's another possibility uh, to be looked at. The third possibility is definitely a, you know, a spiritual possibility. And St. Ignatius of Loyola, for example, says, well, you know, you can have two kinds of anxiety, uh, those that are really warranted, right? So when mm -hmm. I'm getting off the road, and I feel this sense of foreboding and darkness and evil and anxiety. Hey, me, you know, I'm getting off the road. I'm, you know, wandering away from God. And who am I playing to mm -hmm. when I, you know, deliberately get off the road? I deliberately violate the Lord's moral standards. Who am I playing to? Of course, the dark spirit. Mm -hmm. I'm playing to the evil spirit. And ultimately, he'll try and make me feel good to get me off the road. But then when he's got me off the road, his greatest delight is seeing me suffer from it. Right. Fulton J. Sheen's great old, you know, uh, uh, dis description of how the devil just sort of makes you feel good the whole way uh, up to the point of your sin. Mm -hmm. Then you commit the sin. Then he turns right around, becomes the accuser. Mm -hmm. You know, good, lousy wretch. God hates you for it. And your, your so salvation is all over. So, of course, those right. kinds of things, St. Ignatius says, uh, you got to be careful when you're getting off the road, pay attention to the signals so that you will get back on the road. But then sometimes you can have what St. Ignatius calls the devil coming, uh, appearing like an angel of light. Mm -hmm. And when those things happen, right, the devil comes and here you are trying to do the right thing. And I suspect uh, that you might have something like this going on if maybe you don't have a physical or a traumatic or uh, some other kind of um, uh, you know, cause of your anxiety. A lot of times it's this second week kind of anxiety that St. Ignatius calls. The angel comes and he's going to come to you and he says, hey, I've just got the solution. <clears throat> you know, you are looking to become, you know, um, uh, more uh, holy in the sight of God. You're looking to, to really help him out in some apostol apostolic effort to, to you know, help mm -hmm. the church. I, you know, you could be a lot more perfect than you really are. Why don't you just uh, overcome all the uh, deadly sins overnight? And, mm -hmm. you know, you can do it. You know, I mean, that's what God wants. He's going to give you the grace. I mean, there's all kinds of heresies involved in everything. Mm -hmm. But it sounds right is the mm -hmm. point. And so you go, okay, I guess I can overcome all the deadly sins in two weeks. And, of course, you're falling all over yourself as you fail in one thing, then another thing, then another thing. You grow so discouraged, you say, well, God expected me to become perfect overnight, and I couldn't do it, and therefore, well, God never expected that. That's the evil spirit. And the evil spirit has a strategy, and that is to get you to attempt the impossible. Then when you fail to do the impossible, to say that God really expected this of you mm -hmm. and that he is disgusted with you and can't stand you, and then to separate you in that way in your discouragement from God so that at the end of the day you lose him mm -hmm. as your peace, your security, the one who loves you, the one who's leading you, the one who wants you to be saved, you know, and he's, you know, he's basically trying to separate you from the one who loves you through mm -hmm. and through, who's trying to lead you ever more deeply into his love. He's got you now all unconfident. He's got you all, you know, challenging everything. He doesn't love me. He really doesn't. You know, God can love everybody else, but me, he cannot love because I did X, uh, you know, even though mm -hmm. you're trying your very best to do everything. And at that point, says Ignatius, 
um, what winds up happening is you get so discouraged, you lose your sense right. of God being your peace, your security. And, and once you have that, you're dependent right. on yourself alone. And of course, the evil spirit sees you as a great target to put a bunch of arrows into. And right. so, um, you know, you got to be careful as about that and go right. to a good spiritual director. Right. As you were said, told years ago, who are you listening to, right? Wasn't that uh, kind of like... Yeah, know, what spirit right? are you listening, You're listening to? to? Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> right, absolutely. Here's another question. Dear Father Spitzer, the scariest verses for me in the Bible are Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. What can we do to make sure that never happens, that Christ rejects us at the door? Jay. Well, Jay, you know, here's, you got to, again, watch out for the angel of light. What Jesus is trying to say there is that, you know, sometimes when we're saying, Lord, Lord, on the one hand, on the other hand, we're not even attempting to do his will. We talk a good game in front of others. We talk a great game to help evangelize people. But on the other hand, we don't take seriously maybe his moral code uh, or, or something of that nature, or we don't take seriously, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, prayer in our lives or something of that nature. So basically what Jesus is trying to say is we got to be consistent with what we're saying and, you know, overtly trying to do on the outside, let's say, um, you know, trying to help people in their faith which is a very good thing mm -hmm. to do, right? You, you don't want to not stop helping people uh, or stop, you know, praising Jesus in public, right, or, uh, or anything like that. But we also, what Jesus is trying to say, we have to try and follow his way. So he's got these uh, beatitudes. He's got these um, uh, precepts that he has set out there for us. The church gives us various precepts to follow. And if we just say, well, you know, I'll just call upon the Lord, and, um, but I'm not going to try and do anything to follow anything he said. I mean, you don't say it in that way, but you right. basically you're living your life that way. Jesus says that's a wrong strategy. You have to do both. We have to, of course, acknowledge and, and publicly ask the Lord uh, for what we need and turn to him when we have failed for forgiveness. But we also have to try mm -hmm. uh, to follow him. We also have to try um, to follow his teaching, to know his teaching and to follow it. So that is what he's saying. Now, you can get, the devil can use this definitely as an angel of light opportunity here. So basically the devil can come along and say, well, you know, um, you know, you just can't be sure. I mean, <clears throat> Jesus could really get you at the door. Right. But Jay, if you really are trying to follow the Lord, if you really are not just doing that by what you say, but you're trying to follow, of course we're never going to do it perfectly. Or I have, I, mm -hmm. maybe some saints did, but I I'm not one of them. You know, I mean, I'm trying to follow the Lord, but there are, you know, days when I'm good at it and days when I'm not as good at it. And of course, you know, I, I go to confession or I, I um, ask the Lord for forgiveness in the case of uh, venial sins. And I try to just, or in the case of all sins, I ask the Lord for forgiveness. And I do say an act of contrition. But at the end of the day, right, I'm not doubting that God's going to go, you know, I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to get into the kingdom of heaven and I'm absolutely, but I'm not out there doubting that, you know, um, uh, God's good will toward me. That's what the evil spirit wants you to do. I think when God sees you're trying as hard as you can, you're trying to, uh, you know, maintain a good Christian life, and you're trying to, you know, to do what you can to move uh, the cause of right. God and 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 uh, uh, along and trying to share that with people that you're trying to follow His way, His will towards you is going to be exceedingly good and loving and benevolent, as Jesus says again and again. The right. point, of course, is if God is for us, who can be against, against us? us? Right. So that part, that's well, right. Well, it's amazing we live so in a society on one level or either. It. They're either telling everybody's going to heaven or our Lord's looking for reasons to trip yeah. you up, uh, you know. Uh, so, oh, yeah. yeah. So one last question yeah. in the last closing yeah. minutes so we can get to can polish off Satan's tactics here. 
Uh, dear Father Spitzer, yeah. thank you for <laughs> your marvelous God. program. It is a major highlight of the week for me. My question is, what can I say to my brother who is willing to advise his own adult daughters not to have children because of global warming? These young women now look depressed in family pictures, I'll bet. He once was indifferent to the church in which he was baptized. Now he relates to the Catholic Church as an enemy. Do you have any effective reply to people like my brother? This is Mary Ann. So the world is uh, falling apart. Don't have any kids. Yeah. Yeah, well, Mary Ann, I'm just going to uh, just uh, refer you to my book, Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, and, and just go to Chapter 2. Uh, in that book, and the, it's section four on o the um, birth control and the overpopulation myth. Read section 4B on the overpopulation myth. The, the, the fact is, um, you know, when you talk about global warming and things of this nature, um, you know, there are so many complexities that are involved in this. You can't say that the world is going to be a horrible place to live in on the basis of any kind of climate model that we have today. You can't, uh, we know, right, despite the fact that we know that in, in 2064, um, uh, um, we're going to, uh, most of the uh, develop, developed nations of the world will be undergoing um, a uh, population implosion. Certainly by 2076, every developed nation uh, in the world will be undergoing popular, uh, po uh, uh, population implosion. Mm -hmm. And we also know that the birth rate will be dropping in developing countries, and we're going to have a huge problem. It's not going to just be China and Japan and Russia and Germany and Italy and France. Mm -hmm. It's going to be everywhere. Wow. And, of course, once this implosion begins to happen, uh, there's, you know, how are these young people going to support these huge numbers of people, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, that uh, are out there. Are we, you know, the, there, there was this old movie called uh, oh, Soylent Green. Soylent Green, right, yeah. Charlton uh, Heston, you know, yeah. Edward G. Robinson, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, exactly. Where are you, what are we going to do, some draconian mess? Right. Uh, you I think know, it was set in this of, year, of wasn't it? To, it's either set in 2022 or in 2023 when it was made. Oh, was it really? <laughs> We're actually there. I didn't right remember now, that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Oh, oh wow! I'm pretty sure. But, you know, you right. there it is. Yeah, so you have to. We have to look at this very seriously. There's not a population mm. explosion. We need more people in the world, and of course, you say, "Well, wait a minute. We've had this huge, you know, doubling <coughs> and redoubling of population low these many years." Yes, but at the same time, we have not run out of resources. And there we have it with climate change. You know, uh, a lot of people misunderstand exactly what is going on and what we can do. And certainly, as you indicated, as it relates to population uh, issues. So let's ask in the last couple of minutes if we can finish off the deadly sins and Satan's tactics. One of the things that's interesting, I thought, sure. in, in looking through when you, the section talking about Macbeth is that you start off in a sense where the wife is the one who is really you know, getting him to do what's wrong. He does what's yeah. wrong, but he no longer, he starts, he doesn't feel guilty anymore because he goes down that path, but she starts to feel guilty about it. Yes, she does. But of course, she ultimately um, does herself in because right. uh, she can't stand it. And, um, you know, uh, um, I, I mean, the guilt is certainly there. Uh, but uh, he also, of mm -hmm. course, uh, is having his, uh, um, you know, terrible, terrible difficulties uh, wrestling with it. Mm -hmm. But he is trying every step of the way to rationalize right. his way out of guilt. That's what I mean. And right. I think, you know, uh, yeah. And so Shakespeare almost ingeniously mm -hmm. uh, has him. Uh, you know, saying, well, wait a minute now, how do I interpret what that witch said? You know, maybe it could mean this or mean that. Of course, he never quite guesses the right meaning. And of course, Burnham Wood does come to him uh, because regardless of, course, of, he, regardless know, of climate change yeah. or anything, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right, absolutely. That's right. So, uh, so uh, at the end of the day, he. Right. Uh, uh, he winds up destroying himself. He, he knows right. uh, automatically. You know, his whole last speech is, of course, uh, despair. You know, uh, you know, uh, 
and in no question, he just thinks the whole of life is just a few idiotic actors strutting on a stage with no significance whatsoever, right. you know, and so, uh, uh, well, you, you make know, a, uh, there's a like, you, make, oh, you make a really good point in here. You say, Shakespeare's point: No one can escape being judged by one's own actions, not just in the life to come, but in yeah. many cases, here and now. Yep, that's right. And he certainly uh, is experiencing the full range of it, and he's in a complete state of despair. And now he sees that. You know, as he's almost on the brink of complete failure, on the brink of, you know, such moral dilapidation. You know, his wife is gone, his, you know, his plans are being foiled from one step to the next. Talk about pride going uh, before uh, destruction and a haughty mm -hmm. heart before the fall. I mean, he is, uh, you know, everything is truly falling apart, but above all, his own, you know, he can't stand the fact that he has done all these terrible things. He can't even face it. Uh, so all he can uh, do is just say life is meaningless. It's, it's all insignificant or just a right. few uh, actors on a stage. And, you know, he's, he's almost set for suicide. And, of course, if, you know, he hasn't run through by his friend at the end, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, he, he would have uh, eventually... Uh, probably destroyed right. himself in the midst of all the destruction. Anyway, well, you say, yeah. what is gleaned from the tragedy of Macbeth? <laughs> Firstly, as with other tragedies, it speaks of the b blinding, driving, and destructive power of the deadly sin of pride. Yeah, and that's what it is. It is a huge self-blinding, what we were talking about earlier in the program, of hiding these things from ourselves. Right of screening out anything that I don't want to hear. Well, pride is the best, mm -hmm. um, you know, self-editing screen that you can possibly put up. I mean, look at Hitler. I mean, it's so clear that everything is for, is is caving in on him at the end of the war. I mean, the Americans have just come, you know, in, in eight months, they're right, you know, they're crossing the Rhine, they're coming across the, uh, uh, and, and the British, and then the Russians are coming from the east side, they're all the way through Poland, they're just, the pincer is, you know, being closed, and, and uh, Hitler's sitting there going, gosh, these new weapons I'm going to create are really going to get me out of it, and let me just go ahead and look at my whole new um, you know, plan for, um, uh, you know, the, his, uh, his ideal city, right. you know, that he go and review this big model of it. And, uh, you know, it's like, hello, right. you know, everything is, is caving in around you. Uh, any thoughts about what you might want to be doing? And he basically says, the German people need to fight harder. If they fight harder, we will win. Right. Well, Look at that self-screening process. Man, you know, that's a right. reticular activating system that will not quit. And, of course, the only way he can keep from, you know, letting his the horrible, you know, consequences of everything that he's doing, you know, you know how he can repress mm. it in his sleep, he has to take these big drafts of, you know, pills right. and, and powders that his... Uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, therapist and right. advisor is giving him right. his doctor. <laughs> well, they think you know? he might have. I think it's and Parkinson's, it goes, and they actually think he might have had, too, going on at the same time. Oh, oh is that right? Yeah. I think because they've seen may, some may hand well shaking and things like that, you know, those kinds of things. It's interesting, too, because you talk oh. about the idea that, you know, all the ones we've talked about, anger, uh, vanity uh, from the different characters mm -hmm. we've talked about, and envy, but mm -hmm. how pride is the most powerful. And then you kind of, you connect it, yeah. not a, out of the literary world, to the people of the real world, like you said, like Hitler and Stalin, even Saul and Judas. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. There's no question. And, and uh, I do think that uh, pride does have that invasive and insidious quality. You almost don't even notice it as it's completely engulfing your heart mm -hmm. and your soul. So uh, it, it's the most insidious of the deadly sins, that's for sure. So um, in any case, I, I do think that, uh, you know, to let it go or to think it's inconsequential is the worst thing we can ever do. 
we just have to constantly, as St. Ignatius right. says, work on humility. You know, sometimes you gotta have to start with just trying to make your behaviors seem humble, right. then make your behaviors truly humble, then get to the interior attitude of humility. But, you know, uh, if we don't do that, if we don't make the concerted attempt to have some humility before right. others, some respect and compassion for others, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it'll destroy right. us. It, it, you know, what we do to others comes right, boy, that old, you know, what goes around comes, comes around. around. Boy, right. is that true Absolutely. with pride. Absolutely. It does come well, around. It, well, as yeah. you point out here, I can, your, your line near the end here is, which we all hear, there but for the grace of God go I. It's, it, it's that gratitude yeah. we have for the grace we've been given that we don't deserve. And we can't look down at other people yeah. because maybe for some reason it has an impact in them as positively as it has us. That's right. And it's not that God's grace didn't go to that other person. Mm -hmm. It's oh, what you're acknowledging is God's grace went to me and that's why I'm not there, which right. could have happened to me. So, that, you know, why didn't did the person take, well, in the case of Hitler, he right. certainly wasn't interested in the grace of God. That, of course, was freely bestowed on him like anybody else. But he was certainly not right. interested in that. He was certainly a, much more interested in becoming a God himself. Very so, good. Um, With that, you know, we're reading roar. his Nietzsche right. on his bed. Right. right. Or, huh. yeah. it is, and they're looking at maps with his phantom divisions. With that being said, we oh, shall yeah, exactly. uh, close out that <laughs> chapter and this program. If you'll give us your blessing on the way out the door, that'd be great, Father. Uh, absolutely. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord of all consolation and wisdom and virtue send his Holy Spirit down into your hearts that you might truly recognized not only the virtue of humility, but the humility of Christ, the heart of Christ upon which you are dependent and putting yourself completely in his hands, come to the fullness of light and joy in his creative and godly presence in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Be well. We shall see you next week. And don't forget all of Father Spitzer's books and DVDs are available. EWTM Religious Catalog. Next week, we kick things off talking about the Holy Eucharist from Father's book, Escape from Evil's Darkness. So you can pick that up from Religious Catalog. And this weekend, bookmark Greenlee is growing and also the donkey that no one could ride. Anthony DiStefano, a couple of kids' books. Check that out on EWTN's bookmark. And our Lenten prayer service from the Mission of Dolores Basilica in San Francisco with Archbishop Salvatore Corleone as celebrant. That's Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time right here on EWTN. I'm Doug Keck. We'll see you next time in Father Spitzer's Universe. Be well.